Recruiting season is heating up for the Miami Hurricanes football program. We have some good news and some bad news. You are Locked on Canes, your daily podcast on the Miami Hurricanes. Part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. I am Alex Dono, your host. I'm a University of Miami alumnus, longtime South Florida sports radio vet, and contributor to allhurricanes.com. Thank you so much for making Locked on Canes your first listen each and every day. We're available free on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. So uh, we are just uh, a day removed from Elite 11 Orlando. And our guest today, good friend of the program, Brian Smith from All Hurricanes and Fan Nation is with us. Now, Brian, before we get into some of the details of uh, Elite 11 Orlando, we were texting earlier and you told me, hey, for the show today, I got some good news and I got some bad news. So let's start with the bad. And I I have a feeling the bad news might be uh, Air Nolan related. Am I in the the area code for that? (laughs) That is correct. Um, He recently visited Let's see. He's been to Clemson. He's been to Bama. Uh, he's been to Miami recently. Uh, I think Ohio State was his last visit. He's been all over the place. And to his credit, doing his due diligence, the intel I've received is that he's not going to end up at Miami. Mm-hmm. I know that was one of, if not their top target, but he's going to go elsewhere. So that obviously is not the greatest news, but hey, it's better to know now and then still have an opportunity as opposed to like finding out in June or July. Yeah, and since he's going to be announcing his verbal commitment, I guess, somewhere else uh, this week, uh, this Saturday, April 8th, uh, I'm not going to plan too much of a party <laughs> around that. So, yeah. uh, But it, it's terrible. And listen, anyone anyone who watches and listens to this show knows what a big Air Nolan fan I am and my audience is. And listen, I, I wish the young man the best wherever he decides to go because I think he's a great player. I think he's going to crush it at the next level. Very disappointed that it seems like Miami is not going to be the spot for Air Nolan. So hopefully – With that being the bad news, hopefully that leads into the good news. And let me frame the question this way, Brian, because uh, one of our subscribers on our new subtext chat here for Locked on Canes wanted me to ask you, hey, if Miami doesn't land Nolan, uh, who do you see as uh, as being the plan B? And one of the names that he brought up was Luke Moga. Uh, Moga would be my first pick. Uh, He's a guy that I detailed on all Hurricanes. He plays at a program where he doesn't get a lot of help out in Arizona, but he's super mobile. He's the kind of kid that could play slot receiver somewhere if he he really wanted. And he's got a lot of upside. He makes a lot of awkward throws, makes him look easy. And he's the kind of guy that can run the, shall we say, modified version of the air raid that Dawson wants to run for the Hurricanes and what he ran last year at Houston. So that would be my first pick. And I also think there's going to be some good news with some other guys that are around the state that some people may not know about. Okay. Well, let me ask you one that my audience certainly does know about And You were watching him throw in person at elite 11 Orlando, huge show favorite. I've had a chance to meet this young man before interview him. And that's AJ Hairston, incredibly underrated quarterback out of Monarch high school in Broward County. You got a chance to watch him, uh, work out and throw in person, Brian, what can you tell us about AJ Hairston? It's, it's ironic. I have an article that'll be running at noon and he's one of the guys in it. And one of the other guys I'm going to mention here in a second as well. Mm -hmm. AJ is the prototypical big bodied quarterback that can throw it a hundred mile an hour when he wants to, he has learned even since last year, what going back and watching some of his film when he threw for over 3000 yards at Monarch, how to use a little more touch when to use timing with certain things a little differently. He's learning now to just to be a signal caller overall. And yesterday was part of that. The only thing, and I detailed this in the article that I want to see more from him, and this is pretty much every quarterback, is just balance with his footwork and his follow through. Sometimes these kids, they know they've got a big arm. They want to let it rip, especially when we're all sitting there filming them. They know. Right there. And I get it. Uh, a few of his throws, he let get away from him that he shouldn't have. But then there were other ones, tight windows down the field, that were money ball. So physicality is not an issue. He can throw it hundred mile an hour. He's just one in the position. And it still blows my mind that Miami is his only power five offer. Yeah. So I look, I don't get it. It is what it is. But um, if Miami got him as a second quarterback or however you want to rate it with him and Moga, sign me up. I'm, I'm good yeah. with it. 
Do you get the sense, you know, talking to, and obviously you were just watching quarterbacks at Elite 11, but you also, you know, you cover wide receivers around the state that some of these guys, these top wide receivers, maybe want to wait a little bit with Miami because they want to see how they actually look on the field this season, right? Because last year, the wide receivers were not very involved in that offense because the passing game was almost non-existent last year, right? Now you got a new philosophy, new offensive coordinator. So I can understand why a wide receiver at this point is not shy about committing somewhere like Ohio State because you know what you're getting there with Heartline and their offense. I could understand why a four and five star wide receiver, and you know, I, I hope we get some early commits. Don't get me wrong, but I can understand why some of these guys might say, well, "Let me wait till October, November, just to kind of see how that looks out there." I think that's as spot on as it gets. I, I've literally had multiple conversations with players in and out of the state of Florida about Miami and other schools that struggled at the quarterback position, and. They're nervous. There's no two positions connected like QB and wide receiver. So how do you blame them? And Miami's also just brought in a new coach. They at least want to see the spring game. I mean, right. I think that's doing your due diligence as well. So Dawson's offense is extremely quarterback and wide receiver friendly. It shouldn't be that hard once the eyeballs have laid themselves on the actual spring game. And then finally, you know, a couple of games into the season, Remember, Florida kids are very difficult to read anyway. I committed doesn't mean anything in this state more than any other. It's just true. So if the top five kids in this state all committed to other schools, do you think that Mario Cristobal really cares? He's going to recruit them through signing day anyway. And he can say, hey, we're throwing for more and more yards. We're getting better and better. You can be the final piece. That's how this works. It's been going on for decades. Miami will be just fine with wide receiver recruiting. And to your point, they want to see how it kind of works out. I'm very confident that the receivers will be happy with the, what they see this fall. We're joined here by Brian Smith from Fan Nation and AllHurricanes.com. So just uh, to, to recap uh, what we talked about the first couple of minutes, if anyone is tuning in late for whatever reason, we're, we're not very optimistic at all about Miami's chances this week trending into Aaron Nolan's Saturday announcement that uh, we're, we're thinking uh, that he's going to end up taking his talents elsewhere. Uh, I want to talk about some of the other quarterbacks when we come back that Brian was watching at Elite 11 Orlando, including there were a bunch of local guys, Broward and Dade quarterbacks in action. I want to get Brian's take on some of them. So you're going to want to keep it locked right here to Locked on Canes. Folks, I hope that you have locked in your orders at Built.com because these Built bars and puffs and granola bars are delicious. And the Built March Madness bracket is still live. We know you've got a favorite bar or puff, and now's your time to make it count. Go to BuiltMarchMadness.com to vote for your favorites. Uh, I have been voting for and encouraging you guys to vote for my personal favorite. That's the uh, Cookie Dough Chunk Puff Bar. And listen, if you've got your own favorite, vote for whatever you want to. In fact, there are so many Built Bars that I love. It was hard picking a favorite, but we've been voting for the uh, Cookie Dough Chunk Puff, and they're in the Final Four. So I'd like to think that me and our audience have helped them make this Final Four push. Uh, so vote uh, for your favorite to win, and then you'll be voting for that bar. Support your team, support your bar or puff. Unfortunately, our Canes are out of the tournament, but we'll be watching the championship game tonight. And when you vote for your favorite bar or puff, you're going to be entered into a drawing where 50 lucky Locked On listeners will get a free box of Built. Not only that, but one Locked On fan is going to win a 12-month subscription to Built to have Built's best bars or puffs delivered monthly straight to your door. you got to try Built, the best protein bar ever. Seriously, they're so amazing. You're not going to think that they're good for you, but they are. What makes Built bars and puffs so good? Well, they're all covered in 100% real chocolate, and they're high in protein, low in sugar. Run to BuiltMarchMadness.com right now to vote for your favorite bar or puff and pick up a box while you're there. You can vote every day in March, so hop in, and early April as well. So hop in and support your pick. You know I've been doing that because I love me some Built Bars. Thank you so much for making Locked on Canes your first listen today. We're available free wherever you get your podcasts and available free on YouTube. So there were some South Florida quarterbacks, Brian, you got to watch. And, and if I leave anybody out, feel free to add in any names here. But you're watching uh, Cedric Bailey from Chaminade. Uh, who's an NC State commit, uh, Adrian Posse from Miami Northwestern, J.C. Evans from Central, Alberto Mendoza from Columbus High. How did the South Floridian quarterbacks look out there to you? This is a very surprising development. The one thing that South Florida has not done traditionally is quarterback. That's not a newsflash. 
Uh, Evans is the really unique one because he moved from San Antonio down to Miami. But all of them have one thing in common across the board, and that's upside. Uh, Posey, for example, the kid that's now at Northwestern, when he walks out on the field, you're like, holy cow. He is striking because he is a big young man. He has the frame you're looking for, and he has a howitzer for an arm. All of them have needed in some way, shape, or form refinement with something that's ironic. Most kids want more arm strength. It's like dial it down. Uh, Cedric Bailey's arm strength, I mean, he'll throw it through your head. Um, but that was always something that I worried about because he wanted to really juice it up even on some of the shorter passes. Adrian could be that way too. These guys are starting to learn the quarterback position overall. Uh, Bailey in particular, and I even told him yesterday afterwards, this is the best I've seen you play. I thought he was the third best player there. Um, the kid that's committed to Florida State, Croman Hawk, I thought was the best. He, he got an invite. Trevor Jackson, who I'll talk about in a second, he got an invite. He's an Orlando kid. I thought Cedric was the third best. Posey and some of the other guys, it's the same thing. Whoever can be accurate with the arm strength, that's what the Elite 11 coaches want, consistency. And it's not easy. It was hot as bejesus out there. They even stop like in the middle of these and tell them, hey, it's who finishes in this second group or the second time frame that we really look at. They just straight up told them I was standing right there. Huh. And that's what separates. It's smart because by that point, they're already very tired. Mm -hmm. You throw a couple hundred balls. It's a lot of throwing, and it's constant tutelage. Sometimes they get on you, they mix it up, and the kids took it very well. Um, there's at least, just off the top of my head, five or six kids in the senior class in the greater Fort Lauderdale, Miami area that will play Power Five, and it's hilarious because normally that's not the case. I even had a kid tell me yesterday that one of the things he heard from a coach was they don't recruit Florida quarterbacks. They won't they won't do it at all. And I was like, wow, that's that's how bad the stigma is. But I, I think that's going to change. Uh, Teddy Bridgewater and some of those guys has kind of helped pave the way, obviously. But uh, I really liked Mendoza from Columbus. Short throwing motion, hits his targets, very positive. Everybody liked being around him. That's one of the other things that some of the instructors talked about. you got to be likable. Yeah. If you're a quarterback, and like if you're the jerk, you know, if you're the Jeff George guy, <laughs> it doesn't work. Not in today's society, especially where everybody's thin skinned. We can say what we want. But there's very few people that aren't. So that's important. Um, I think that Merdinger from Cardinal Gibbons might be the highest from where he's at from perception right now to where he's going to end up. He had to play behind Dylan Risk, who signed with UCF. He was super accurate yesterday. Great throwing motion. Put the ball where he wanted on short passes, long passes, etc. Where have all these quarterbacks been? You know what yeah, I mean? Like South Florida no. just doesn't normally have that. It wouldn't surprise me if one of these kids, J.C. Evans too, ended up at Miami. I don't know. It's just a matter of figuring out who's going to be the first guy to make it make it happen. Once the dominoes fall, it's part of it. And it's it's fun to talk about. I have no idea, and I know them all. <laughs> I mean, it's I have no idea. I'm sure that Dawson is going to want some of them to come over again and throw. You yeah. can't have enough film of quarterbacks. Just can't do it. So maybe it'll drag into summer. I'm, I'm totally speculating. I have no insight on that. But even if they, let's say they got MOGA early, just hypothetically, they need two, in my opinion, because they only got one last year and they tried to take two. Right. They want. And chances two. are, TVD, correct me if I'm wrong, expectation is he's leaving come hell or high water. Probably. Barring injury, you know, injury aside. This season, he's going to take his chances with the National Football League. That's a thin roster. It's only two guys. So you need a transfer maybe or a two-quarter, something of those of those lines. And they could get at least one of them from South Florida. And one of our listeners asked us on our subtext chat, and maybe the answer is one of these names or some of these names you already threw out there. He wants to know who kind of this year's version of Emory Williams could be, where Emory last year really flew under the radar. Miami got interested in Emory kind of very early in the process. He didn't start getting interest from other big schools until Miami was already interested. Now, he wanted me to ask you about this so you can give your own answer. My answer for him personally was, I think A.J. Hairston is already becoming that guy, that that to me is the guy who, you mentioned it, Miami is his only Division One offer, which is shocking because the so kids bizarre. can play. <laughs> So do you agree with that on Hairston? Is there anybody else who you think could be kind of this year's Emory Williams? 
any of the kids that I just mentioned, I've had co- I've had people from other schools reach out to me, other scouts ask me, etc. It is a really unusual year for the state of Florida. Think about Miami's history at quarterback. There have been a couple of Florida guys, but since the early 80s, it's been 90% of the guys have been out of state. It's just true. Yeah. So to go and, and find one is good news. Harrison could certainly be the guy. Wouldn't I wouldn't have any problem with that, as I noted earlier. But why not Merdinger? Why not one of the other guys like Evans or what about Mendoza? Any of them could be that second guy. Again, I have no idea which one it's going to be. And in my opinion, they should offer Trevor Jackson. I I knew he was good because I'd Mm. seen him play a few times before. He was money yesterday. He told me Pitt and Indiana and a few other schools are offering him. But it's amazing to me that he doesn't have 15, 20 offers that are from higher level schools. But you know, I don't make those decisions. Uh, he plays at West Orange in Orlando. They play some big boy football up there, too. He would be a great offer for Miami. I want to ask you about a couple non-quarterbacks that Miami's been trending pretty well with in recruiting. Uh, let's start with safety, Zaquan Patterson out of uh, Chaminade, who uh, just had, uh, I think it was on the weekend of the 23rd, had a very productive visit at Miami, and some of the recruiting analysts like the momentum Miami is building. Is he a big time player too? He's a four star uh, and Miami, they didn't recruit a lot of safeties. They got Caleb Spencer, who we really like, but they missed on some other targets last year. He's one of my favorite kids in the class and I'm biased because he's just fun to be around. Uh, As I mentioned with Mendoza and some of these other guys, it matters when you have the right kind of personality. Zaquan, we're we're at seven on or anything else. It doesn't matter what the event is. He's a positive dude. He doesn't mind the media asking him questions. He likes to chop it up. And he, when you watch him just kind of just walk in front of you, you're like, that's what a power five safety looks like. He's got big arms, shoulders, chest, everything. He fits the profile of somebody not only play, but play early. And Miami's going to need it. I, I would be surprised if both their safeties didn't leave after this next year. I don't know what your take is. But their safety depth is not exactly ideal right now, and I'm being very kind. He could start. Is that what you want? No, but he still might start. He's very smart, too. Uh, Shamanad's a good school. He's a kid that's going to do well academically at Miami or wherever he would go. I bet he would pick up the defensive looks that he has to – I mean, and safety's hard, too. It's harder than corner to pick up. But I bet you he would gravitate to that rather quickly, and he'd, he'd enjoy the challenge. He is the all-encompassing guy that you want. Doesn't matter if you're Alabama. Doesn't matter if you're Michigan. Doesn't matter. He could fit in anywhere. He is a must-have recruit for the Hurricanes. I agree also with what you said about Miami's current safeties because, uh, like, I'm expecting Cam Kinchins to be a first-round pick just based on the way he's played. And then with with James, he could be anywhere from – a first round pick to like a fourth or fifth round pick, but like they're like, it would be almost impossible for James not to be, you know, like a, like a draftable guy. Cause he's got all those, you know, physical he's tangible intangible. things. Oh, yeah. So he's, he's, he's got all those measurables. And so even if he doesn't have a very good year this year, someone's going to take a flyer on him probably no later than the fourth round. Have you seen many guys like him? I mean, he's, He's rarefied air. He's listed at six five. I don't know if he is, but he's he's at least six. He's at least six four. Yeah. Like when I when he came out of high school, I'm like, I doubt he can really stick at safety. He, he's not necessarily perfect, yeah. but his fluidity and the way he turns and he sprints, he's what the NFL wants. Like he's drawn up on the board. So if you lose both, I mean, I'll ask you, who's Miami's next safety this year? If you had the uh, gun to your head right now, who would it be? Markeith Williams, I would say, because uh, okay. he, he's he's been he's been trending. I mean, spring practice, he's been looking pretty good in spring practice. Sure. Um, and you know, I think I think probably by twenty twenty four, I think Caleb Spencer would be able to play pretty significantly. So the, those, I mean, I, I think yeah, I'm not, I'm not counting on too much from him as a true freshman this year, sure. but I think by twenty twenty four, he could probably go out there and make some noise. But there, there's no question, Miami needs to to keep recruiting safeties big time. So I want to when we come back. I want to ask Brian Smith about David Stone, who's a five-star player, one of the best in the class. He's been trending pretty positively to Miami in recent days and weeks, so I want to get Brian's take, and I want to get uh, Brian's thoughts on a, a beautiful Final Four run that unfortunately came to an end on Saturday for the Miami Hurricanes. So keep it locked right here to Locked on Canes. 
Thank you so much for making Locked on Canes your first listen today. We do have the championship game tonight. I know we're all upset that Miami is not a part of it, but you want to keep listening to our good pals, Andy Patton and Isaac Shade, who do an incredible job locked on college basketball each and every day. They cover the national college basketball scene. So make sure to check that show out, Locked on College Basketball, free on YouTube and free wherever you get your podcasts. So, yeah, listen, Brian, I know that a lot of competition for David Stone, who's a five star. Like, I, you know, I talked about him the other day with Larry Bluestein and Blue said that he's actually got Stone, the second ranked overall player in the class for his rankings behind only Jeremiah Smith. That He's got Jeremiah Smith, number one, David Stone, number two. And it seems like that sort of the, the three top players for Stone are developing as Michigan State. Oklahoma, which is actually his home state school. He plays at IMG, but he's from Oklahoma. And Miami is in that mix. That it seems to be those three appear to have a lead right now. He did take consecutive weekend visits to Miami these last two weekends, and he's saying a lot of nice things. So uh, how legit is David Stone, and where do you think Miami stands with him? Let's start with the physical aspect of it. He plays at IMG, as you mentioned, and they have their own version of a pro day. I mean, they have that many guys. They need to do it. And all the media from around the country will fly in, drive in, whatever. I'm close enough I can drive, fortunately. But I remember I was just going through. I thought, you know what? I'll just get some of these 40s. And they're running right at me, like right up to my to my iPhone. And Stone got up there. And I, I'm looking at him before he got down in his stance. And I'm like, man, that's, that's what you want a D lineman to look like. He got about halfway through it, and I thought to myself, that's what I want a running back to run like. Uh. But he's – it's just not normal, okay? He, he's – even for IMG guys and all that, his foot speed is ridiculous. And I was talking to one of the Oklahoma guys from 24-7. He, he knows him for a long time, and he said, we've known since he was in seventh grade. Wow. And I was like, oh, wow. And he's like, yeah, he was just – he was just different than everybody and he's a good kid and all that. He's, he's total package. So anyway, watching him do moves in the bag drills, watching him move laterally in particular, he carries himself physically like he's 210, but I don't know, he's 280 or something like that. It's, it's ridiculous. So he's one of those get up the field three techs. That is, if you don't block him with two and screw up your own blocking techniques by doing it, because then somebody, everybody else is one-on-one, -on -one, you put your quarterback at risk. Not many guards are going to handle him on third mm. and seven. Mm. That's why every school in the country is after him. He, he's been to Washington. He's been to school like A&M. He's been to Miami, Michigan State, Wisconsin, all over the country. He has the most widespread recruitment of any player in the country in this class. It's because he's that rare. So Miami is doing well to get him on campus. I, I I think he's been like two, three times to Miami. Of course, it's yeah. Yeah, three hours, four hours, something like that from IMG. And there's obviously Maui Go and those guys are still communicating with him. Do they have a shot? Yes. If he keeps coming back, they absolutely have a shot. The thing that I want to see, how does his visit order line up? And when does he finalize? We asked him at IMG and he was kind of hoping to get it done this summer. But I don't think that a commitment – will mean a whole lot for me because nobody's going to stop recruiting him. Yeah. He changes your program. You have to continue. Like you think a and going to care if he committed to Miami or Michigan state or something? No. Yeah. So Miami has an advantage, even if they don't get him in the first push, whenever he commits, because I'll bet you money that he comes down and visits Miami again, if he doesn't pick them off the bat. So he is definitely a player to watch. You've been one of our hoops correspondents for the last couple of months. Uh, you know, the way I look at it, there was obviously a lot of stuff Miami could have done better in that game against UConn, but I don't have too many regrets because the Huskies were just the better team. Like I, you know, it's not one of those things where it's like, oh, Miami completely shot themselves in the foot. They were not the best team on the court that night. Two things about that game surprised me. Number one, the way it started was just bizarre. The guy that hit the big guy, Sanoga, yeah, he's a good player. He's a very good, very good basketball player. He'd hit one three in the tournament. He hit two in the first four minutes. Yeah, crazy. I mean, that, that but that's why March Madness is so bizarre. Did anybody really pick Purdue to get beat by a 16 seed? You know what I mean? Outside of some family members from that team. You know, it, that's why March Madness is so much fun and why I've watched it my entire life. It's it's a blast. That being stated, a couple of things did drive me nuts. Miami got it down to eight. With around mm -hmm. 10, eight minutes, 
Wuga Poplar did not hit a shot in the game. And, and look, at some point, you just got to put the ball in the bucket. Somebody asked Bob Knight once, what's the most important attribute a player could, could do? And he said, make shots. It, 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 sometimes it's a forest for the trees. Miami might have still won, even though they played like dirt for a lot of the game, if they just could have hit a few more shots. A few of them were wide open. Look, they succumbed to the pressure some. UConn did not. You have to give them, as you noted, full credit for that. They have role players hitting shots. They obviously, the big guy even scored more than he normally does, and they just had better team defense. Miami left too many shooters open. That's not disciplined basketball, and ultimately it cost them. Unfortunate to see it come to an end, but it was a great run. Um, guys, before we wrap it up here, I want to remind you we have a new SMS service through the show through subtext. Uh, I include a link in the show description. So if you're watching on YouTube or you are a podcast listener, you're going to find a link in the show subscription. Uh, we give you guys, you know, previews of episodes, information I gather from practices, all sorts of intel that we give to you guys on subtext before we give it to you on a show. So it's a way to keep the conversation going. Uh, you get the first two weeks completely free. After that, it's $4.99 a month. Uh, but, you know, you can opt out after 14 days. If you don't feel like you're, you're getting your money's worth, it's a good way to support the show financially. Uh, so check that out. The link is going to be included on the show description below. Huge thank you to Brian Smith. You can follow him on Twitter at FBScout underscore Florida. Brian, thank you. And I think I'll be seeing you later this week at, at Kane's practice. So I, I look forward to that. Absolutely, man. Need to get some photos and see what's going on with the Hurricanes. Absolutely. All right. So we'll talk to you guys again next time on another episode of Locked on Canes, part of the awesome Locked on Podcast Network, your team.